Hello, a quick intro before the intro. This will be just a quick self-promotion thing where I let you know I'm on BitChute and Rumble. And here's a freebie from the alternative platforms to let you know what you can find on said alternative platforms where I upload more often. On with the show. Hello and welcome to Alt Tech Exclusive number 164, and this episode will cover the history of grafting. First, we'll cover the definition of grafting. The method of grafting is to propagate one existing genotype by taking a piece of wood from that genotype and grafting it onto the rootstock of a separate genotype. This occurs when seeds and cuttings are not viable means of propagating a plant such as in situations where cuttings do not root, or in the case of plants that end non-annual plants. You see in farming, the holy grail is to create a totally uniform plant situation. In self-pollinating crops, this is easy. You artificially make the cross and let the self-pollination happen. By the time 12 generations pass, you will have multiple pure line genotypes that have been fixed into their current genetic situation. In naturally cross-pollinating annuals, you can use different methods of forced inbreeding, and then cross-breed those inbred lines to make F1 hybrids. For perennial plants, this is not an option because their lifespans are too long for inbred lines or F1 hybrids to be developed efficiently. As such, asexual reproduction through cutting or grafting is useful to produce a large amount of a single genotype. Another aspect of grafting that is often useful is the avoidance of juvenility. Many trees and shrubs have long juvenile phases of their life cycle. During this time period, they cannot flower. Grafting mature sign wood onto a root system of a seedling can guarantee that the juvenile phase is skipped, allowing a plant to reach full maturity at a far faster rate. As mature flowering, sign wood still maintains its flowering characteristics. Other means is to create unusual growth forms. Some rootstocks have unique architecture, such as the tree form of Rosa multiflora or the cultivar Dr. Huey. Grafting a normal variety allows for the maintenance of this shape while adding new flowers. There's also cultivar change as an option. If you don't like the cultivar you're growing on your current root stock, you can chop off the sign wood and replace it with a new cultivar by grafting something new onto it. There are also various root stocks that can also control the size of the plant by virtue of having a smaller root system, limiting the size that the plant can grow to, and various root stocks can pass on certain resistances to both biotic and abiotic disorders to the sign wood. Now on to the history of this practice. The first speculative idea of when grafting took place was in Mesopotamia, where various individuals who translate the Sumerian texts, such as Dr. Harlan, Dr. Harris, Dr. Maberly, and Dr. Lyon, suggest that the writings are referring to grafting salt-resistant grape varieties onto salt-tolerant wild rootstock. This is pure, your knowledge may vary, but if this speculation is true, then this will be the earliest known use of grafting. Now on to the earliest known example that we know of in terms of grafting. The Hebrew Bible was written over a course of a thousand years, between 1400 BCE and 400 BCE. And various texts seem to indicate that during that time period, grafting was a thing. One such passage of Isaiah 5, 1-2, seems to suggest the use of grafting on grapes. In the more Hebrew-centered Bible for Judaism, the Mishnah, specifically Kalim 1-4, lists several fruit tree 
rootstock sign combinations that are allowed within Judaism. Several scholars also interpret Psalms 128.3 to be a reference to grafting, the verse stating, your sons like all seedlings surrounding your table. Grafting likewise was used as an analogy for how Gentiles can integrate into Israel in Romans 11.24. It was also mentioned in the Book of Mormon, Jacob 5.17-18, although I would not count that as part of history since grafting had already been a mainstream thing within America by the time the Book of Mormon was written. Now onto ancient Greece and Persia. In ancient Greece, the earliest verifiable written account about grafting was the book on the nature of the child. This book was written in 424 BCE by various followers of Hippocrates long after he died. The quote from the passage that mentions grafting can be found within the image on the screen. The passages within this book suggest that the technique of grafting was already commonplace by the time this book was written, indicating that it's older than the 4th century BCE. This book also speculates on how the sign would get the nutrients from the rootstock. The explanation of this committee seems to be a very pseudo-spiritual mechanism that was echoed by Theophrastus, who picked up where he left off. In Persia, the, the earliest known evidence of grafting within that area was day between 4000 BCE to 3001 BCE, based on images on remnants of pottery. Remnants of Cyrus the Great's garden in 500 BCE also indicate that grafting was well underway within that region. Dr. Juniper and Dr. Maberly suggest that grafting may have been first discovered within Persia and spread out from there, although as of right now, no direct evidence of this phenomenon is present. In ancient Rome, which got most of its information from ancient Greece, the earliest known writings about grafting was by Cato in his book The Agricultura, which describes a method of grafting. Another piece of writing by, by the philosopher Marcus Terentis Varro did a large series of experiments to see the limitations of grafting and what is compatible with what. Pliny the Elder did a similar experiment although both did not understand the full mechanics of what was happening and why one failed and the other succeeded. By the 4th century CE, the philosopher Rutellus Tauros Amelius Palladius offered a 14-book work called Opus Agriculturae, of which in the last book, which was a long list of, was a long list of every possible grafting combination available. A high number of incompatible combinations indicate that Mr. Palladius was not writing from personal experience, but rather compiling it from other writers. Now on to China. Reports of Chinese agriculture prior to the 14th century BCE are largely mythical because historical records in China in the very beginnings are very sparse. You do not get a large number of different writings about the history of China until 400 BCE, long after its foundation. The best researchers can come up with right now is that Grafting occurred sometime between 2000 BCE and 1001 BCE, although one dubious claim stated that during the reign of the Emperor Ta Yu, who lived between 2197 and 2205 BCE, grafting was invented to deal with citrus. Another account suggests that, based on the writing of the Chu, a type of Chinese-style herbal, Various writings, especially during 1560 BCE, showcased the use of grafting. Dr. Juniper and Dr. Maberly suggest that it may have started in 300 BCE with the development of the Chinese silk industry. But the only well-confirmed, direct, credible evidence of grafting within China was in the book Fan Sheng Shu, written during the 1st century BCE. The original book was long since lost. The original copy has been lost but excerpts of this book have been incorporated into 6th century CE texts. One such excerpt describes the grafting of bottle gourd. Another describes the use of crab apple. Another describes pear grafting. And still another describes jujube grafting and pomegranate grafting. Now onto the medieval era. In medieval Europe, based on 
the facts of surviving records of agriculture from ancient Greece and Rome, and the fact that he began translating Greek and Roman documents into English around 897 BCE, it's probable that grafting was introduced around that time in Europe. Likewise, in the Islamic world, during the Dark Ages, the Arabs were the major successors to the Greeks and Romans, as they took on much of the knowledge and ideology of the ancient Greeks and Romans, making use of grafting throughout that era. Within Persia, there was a cultural history of deep love for plants and gardening. This carried over for a time into the Islamic empires. As such, a great many poems inspired by gardening were common during that time period. Alongside various writings, talk about the different mythologies surrounding grafting. It's likely from this culture that a great many superstitions surrounding grafting entered Europe. Now on to Renaissance Europe. In 1440, John Garner wrote the book The Fate of Gardening. As of right now, only two copies still exist of this work, but what is known is that there's a section on grafting, during which one of the earliest known dwarfing apples was mentioned, Paradise Apple. This variety was permanently used as a rootstock and was propagated by cuttings, and is the first example of clonal rootstocks within Europe. This is important because the M8 and M9 rootstocks, the most common rootstocks used for a long period of time for dwarfing apple trees, are direct lineal descendants of the Paradise Apple Tree. Following the creation of the printing press during the 16th century, increased literacy plus an increased demand for horticultural works led to the creation of new books regarding grafting and agricultural husbandry. Much of these works were based on the works of previous grafting specialists within ancient Greece and were refined over time. Although most of the scholars who talked about it overstated the capabilities of grafting and understated the compatibility issue within grafting. In early modern Europe, in 1618, William Lawson published a book on orchard gardening, and during his time he talked about propagation-related topics such as grafting and budding methods, to such a great degree that translating it into modern English could be possible, allowing for the repeating of the same technique. Likewise, like in earlier times, the limitations of grafting were not fully known, and due to the extents of plagiarism, this was slow to be corrected. This was ended by the researcher Dr. Robert Sharrock in 1630-1684 in his book The History of Propagation and Improvement of Vegetables, where he actually did the experiments himself and experimented with grafting of different vegetables and trees. This created a renaissance in grafting testing to see how far the grafting operation can go, whittling away the false combinations found in earlier documents. One of the claims he made is that grafting operations must be made within the same compatibility group. Apples with crab apples and our species of crab apple, pears with our pears and quince, for instance. But we had not yet gone to a pure mechanistic scientific method, and there's still some magic within his works, as seen on his diagram on how grafting works. Now on to the 19th century. During the 19th century, an accidental introduction of a wine root parasite called Phytoxera to Europe from the Americas nearly brought about the end of grapes within Europe, and to this day it's never been wiped out. These little aphids feed on the roots rather than the leaves of different species of grape. It was later found by the researchers J. E. Planchon, V. Segnot, J. E. Westwood, and J. Lichtenstein that this species is less able to feed on the roots of American grape species, and these roots are able to survive the damage, indicating that these species were resistant. Coevolution between the host, the American grape, and the aphid seems to have led to both of them being able to tolerate each other. Phytoxera never existed within Europe, and as such, European grape species never had any resistance to this species. After different types of Pesticides seemed to have caused expensive problems. It was discovered that 
despite the consternation of the wine purists that grafting regular wine varieties onto American rootstock imparted resistance onto the resulting plant. The argument of whether or not you can use sulfur injections into the soil or American rootstocks was settled in 1869. The species Vitis riparia and Vitis rupestris were not used due to be not well adapted to chalky soils. Next came Vitis belrindiae, another American species that was phytoxia resistant, but did poorly when it came to routine from cuttings. The final solution to this bug problem was crossbreeding Vitis belrindi with Vitis riparia to create more easily propagated varieties of wild grape that are still suited to the wine regions of France. A similar problem was with Phytophthora within ancient and modern Italy as well as other parts of South America, in which Phytophthora and other diseases damaged the root system of common oranges. It was found that sour orange, or mandarin, was resistant to Phytophthora until a virus called Tritia virus came in and knocked out the sour orange as a rootstock. It was then replaced with a trifoliate orange, a deciduous cold-resistant citrus relative that was resistant to Trista, which then became the replacement for the sour orange rootstock. Now on to the 20th century. In the 20th century, several new innovations came about. One was in vitro grafting. This was a process of growing roots and shoots from cell cultures of specific plants and then grafting the in vitro produced shoots onto the in vitro produced roots. This results in reproductively mature in vitro seedlings that are relatively virus free due to the nature of tissue culture. These grafted seedlings would also be, well, grafted, allowing them to be used as mother trees for future plantings. This sped up the production of new plants available for production in terms of citrus and played a major factor in improving Spanish citrus industries. Now on to vegetable grafting. I covered this in the previous episode so watch that video for that information. In terms of flower bud grafting, for the Taiwan pear industry, pears do not flower within Taiwan due to insufficient chilling. This is overcome with flower bud grafting where trees in Japan who have received the needed chilling are harvested and shipped to Taiwan where they're grafted onto the tree where they bloom and produce fruit. This process has to be renewed each year to produce fruit. The last modern technique was the mukabit grafting of cassava. It was discovered that a close relative of the cassava, the carrot rubber tree, is actually compatible with cassava. The Kara rubber tree is then grafted onto the cassava resulting in the roots of the cassava producing more tubers, which is what we eat when we eat cassava. Now onto the history of rootstocks. On another modern note, it was also found that in a paper by Brandon S. Gout, Allison J. Miller, and Daniel K. Seymour of the University of California, University of Missouri, and the Donald Danfer Plant Science Center of St. Louis, I found quite a few more interesting things about grafting. By testing Arabidopsis faniala seedlings, it was found that the general theme is attachment followed by phloem reconnection, which takes three days after grafting for Arabidopsis, followed by resuming of root growth, which takes five days, xylem reconnection, which takes seven days, it was found that gene reactivation occurs between both cells, developing new auxins to begin fusing the two cells together. Other experiments with tobacco found that, indeed, genes are being exchanged within the graft union. But there's still some mysteries. The reason why grafting is not always successful is incompatibility. In the case of monocots, there are almost no examples of grafting. This has to do with the arrangement of their vascular bundles. It is unknown why it works the same way with eudicots and gymnosperms. We know that grafting compatibility is closely linked to phylogenetic relatedness, and there's no rules, but there are exceptions. 
For instance, many times, various species can only be grafted onto their own species. In other cases, they can be grafted to closely related species. A former example would be almonds, plums, and peaches, which are incompatible with each other for grafting, even though they're all part of the same genus. But crab apples can be grafted onto apples and vice versa, even though they're different species. And different species of pear, and even other species in a different genus, such as quince, can all be grafted onto each other. It's suggested that this is caused by def defective hormone signaling. Experiments with Arabidopsis using mutants showcases that defects in oxygen and cytokinin biosynthesis signaling do not abolish graft formation. Other experiments with fur showcase that graft incompatibility was heritable very highly, and it's likely due to the existence of very specific additive genes. And whether or not a species is compatible with each other in terms of grafting is determined by only a few genes. In such cases, crossbreeds between peach and plum have showcased that within each population of hybrids, a certain number of them are the graft incompatibility trait is caused by two dominant genes. A similar phenomenon was found in hoop pine. Now onto the history of clonal rootstocks. The earliest known example of rootstocks reproduced via asexual propagation was a wild pear variant, either of Pyrus phalocopra or Pyrus betufolia, two wild pear species known in China. One of them was used to breed the cultivar Tang, which was then mass propagated for grafting purposes to increase pear size. In the 17th century, it was known that quince had dwarfing effects on pear, and specific varieties were used for grafting purposes that were likewise mass propagated. Tang was developed in the 6th century AD. During the era of Alexander the Great, he found an interesting apple called the spring apple, which was used as a dwarfing rootstock for other apples. Thanks to the research of Aristotle, and later on, Theophrastus, it is likely that this cultivar is a direct ancestor to what we call paradise. Other dwarf rootstocks were also found, such as French Paradise and Marga Kisler, the former being made in France and the latter in Armenia. The Paradise plan was introduced into England in 1696. Marga Kisler, the Armenian version, seems to be a sibling or close relative of this variety, as they both share similar genes. Due to constant renaming of existing plants, a new organization created in the 1900s at Kent, called the East Mullen Research Station, was created. All the existing rootstocks that they knew of were gathered in 1917 and renamed to remove confusion. They were renamed as M1, M2, M3, etc, etc. Eventually, all 27 were released, and were classified as dwarf, semi-dwarf, vigorous, very vigorous, and standard. In time, it increased to 111, as different breeding programs to improve the existing rootstocks were made, especially using other cultivars such as Northern Spide to improve resistance to woolly apple aphid. Fifteen selections were made, and these were M101 to M115. These became the base of a great many new cultivars that are bred for dwarfing purposes, and other purposes as well. And that ball covers everything, thank you for watching.